I want to start tonight with um, uh, a little passage from Matthew chapter 11 in the message at the end of the chapter. This is Jesus speaking and Jesus says, um, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, come to Jesus, G uh, get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me and watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I, I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. And that uh, passage has been a, a real um, a comfort to me and to my family over the last uh, five years. We were burnt out on religion and, uh, and we have come to learn something of those unforced rhythms of grace. And uh, I said to Don um, when the series came up, um, I really wasn't, um, <clears throat> uh, I, I didn't think I was uh, too equipped to do uh, one of these sort of series. I wasn't that good on apologetics and uh, so on. And uh, so uh, he just said to me, uh, oh, well, why don't you do uh, I love Jesus and hate the church? And, uh, and he smiled as he said it. He said, you've probably, I think you've got some experience in that. So I said I would, but this was a month, couple of months ago. And um, we, uh, I had a trip to the Northern Territory to help our son, uh, who's moving with his family up there, to help them on their house. And, and then uh, when I was ready to go again and Don had announced me, uh, I came down with COVID and uh, that knocked me out for a few weeks. And uh, so finally, uh, it, it, it's come. And, uh, but, I, but I look also at that in a sense as God's timing because probably the message has changed over those uh, five or six weeks and, uh, and I've actually uh, come across a couple of people from, from our old church. Um, my family and I were in, in a church that, and we look back on how, how badly burnt we are. In a sense... The old place always had an answer for church. Um, you know that uh, Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, we could quote, not neglecting to uh, meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near and, and how Jesus loved the church. Uh, but the problem was the church was not operating the way it should have been operating. It wasn't operating a Jesus way. As, as I've said to people, <clears throat> we didn't really have to change our doctrine coming here. In a sense, the, the doctrinal statement of the old church and, and City Light's doctrinal statement is very similar. Uh, but it was the way that we operate in, in everyday life. And, um, you know, just to give you an example... Uh, often in the old place, uh, you know, 1 Peter 2, when things were done against you that were wrong or unfair, well, it would be quoted um, that, uh, you know, what credit is there if you do wrong and are beaten, you endure it. But when you do what is good and suffer, you endure it. But the problem is that passage is about us living out in an evil, wicked world where we've got to shine as lights. It's not meant for us to be living in a church where unfair and unjust things are done and we sort of have to just accept them. Instead of a healthy church starts to draw boundaries about what is right and true and, and what is fair. And yes, there will be times that people ignore you or you disagree things. We're not talking about that. We're really talking about spiritual abuse. And I guess the more, I, as I've been gone from the old church about five years, I've come to see how prevalent the issue is of spiritual abuse. We often hear about sexual abuse. And tonight is, is not meant in any way to um, 
disregard that or say it's not important. It is incredibly important and, and we have to be so strong on that. But there is also within the church this spiritual abuse that is pretty widespread and we have to be alert for it. We can't be uh, naive. Um, you know, a family, uh, when we left the old church, uh, we were condemned with five verses. And uh, we had to say, you have either misinterpreted or misapplied each of those five verses. Another family told us who had gone to a, a different church, uh, when they decided to leave, the pastor said to them, you've got to uh, give us five verses as to why you should leave. Well, they went and did their homework and, uh, and went back to him and he said, uh, you've totally misinterpreted those scriptures. And uh, so they left. But anyway, you just start to see how it is so easy for a church to slip in to a misinterpretation of, uh, of the scriptures in order to further its, its own end. You see, I, I think, you know, Ruth and I probably fully expected to finish there. You know, I'd already in my mind worked out my funeral arrangements and the song, you know, hymn to sing at the funeral and Ruth just rolls her eyes. But, but anyway, we, we sort of, and, and we expected our family who had all come to the Lord there. Uh, you know, we got five kids and, and they'd all come to the Lord and, and I, I believe, you know, are quite genuine in their faith. We, we expected them to go on for generations. We'd had this uh, beautiful vision from uh, Deuteronomy 6 of, uh, where it says, these words that I'm giving you today are in your heart. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. And if your son asks you in the future, what's all this about? You can say, God did an amazing work in our lives. And that was this kind of model that we had in, in the old place. It was an amazing start. Many of us had come to know the Lord on, on campus or in the hospital, or the nursing, or nursing side of things. And, uh, and God had brought us together as a beautiful group. And many of us had received that kind of mentoring, personal help to really help us to grow and become strong uh, in the Lord. And, and not only to grow ourselves, but to be able to help others also. Uh, and as part of that great commission to, to teach people all that I've commanded you to pass it on from one generation to another. But I think one of the problems was so many of us had grown up without what I would call a natural Christian family life. And so what was being... Op the, the way the church was starting to operate was not the natural, normal, spiritual Christian life. As one man said, used to say to us, let your natural life be spiritual and your spiritual life be natural. He was trying to say, let's, let's learn to live naturally in our everyday life, not just Sunday Christianity, but every day. But the problem was it was not like that. It became very strained. You know, let me give you another example and it, it's not so much about condemning a, a church because there are many churches in a sense like this we've come to see it's about we have to be alert we have to be on guard for the future because a church as I look back at our church I did come to the Lord there it, it was so helpful in so many areas of my life but for the next generation, instead of a beautiful dream, it became a nightmare. And we just, uh, and I'm, in one sense, I'm sorry to be talking about such a solemn topic, but we do need, we can't be naive about the whole issue of spiritual abuse in a church. But, you know, the Bible says uh, don't gossip. 
uh, we had that in the old church and, and I still believe the Bible says don't gossip. You know, Proverbs says the words of a whisperer are like delicious morsels. Um, and, and Proverbs 26, for lack of wood, the fire goes out. So gossip is, is wrong when we just sort of blurt out things that we don't need to say. But the problem was the old place would use that to isolate people and say you're not allowed to say anything from one family to another or from one individual to another about what's going on. And it made it very hard to operate naturally. You know, one woman told me, she asked someone, um, oh, where did you go for holidays? And uh, the, the reply was, uh, oh, we stayed in a house with a roof on it. And I'm, uh, this is true. And, and I, I just, you look back and I, sometimes I laugh at some of the crazy sort of stuff that somehow uh, we got caught up in. But I want us to see that just as sexual abuse can be incredibly damaging, spiritual abuse can be incredibly damaging in people's lives. And um, one, one night I was uh, sitting at home working on the computer and uh, my daughter, uh, daughter came to see me and she, and she said, Dad, I just want to talk with you. And uh, she said, do you realise there are five of my generation who are talking about taking their own lives. And uh, I guess from that point, uh, I, I couldn't go back. I, there was something that uh, God just, uh, in a sense, awakened me to what was really going on. The problem with everyone being so isolated, you, you didn't have really understand what was going on in other families, in other people's lives. <clears throat> and, um, and, and I uh, was in, uh, in the Kurong bookshop a few weeks ago and, uh, um, and I met someone who was, was at, at the old church at the counter and, uh, and I paid for my books and was about to walk out and I, I saw her over in the bookstalls and, and the Lord said, well, I think you ought to go over and, um, and just uh, you know, say it was good to catch up with you and meet you. And I went over and uh, she said to me uh, words to the effect that in some ways you probably think it a bit strange that I'm still there at the old place, but I just want you to know the last 10 years of my life I have just felt so controlled and used up and it's like my 10 years have been wasted. And I said to her, well, I'm very sad to hear that. I, we had to leave because um, there were five young people talking about ending their lives and, and you can't go on when that kind of environment is there. And she said, uh, well, I was probably number six. And we, as we talked, we were both weeping, standing there in the middle of Kurong, we were both weeping as we talked about that. And I just want you to understand how damaging this spiritual abuse that happens in churches can be. I, uh, uh, the, the advantage um, of having six weeks delay in preaching is sometimes God brings other people along and I met another uh, young woman uh, who said, uh, uh, said she just wanted to, got in touch, she said she just wanted to catch up. She'd left the church and she said, I just want, to, uh, just want to give you a hug. Even though my old church calls it the devil's handshake, I just want to give you a hug. And I want to share with you, uh, and, I, and, I, and you saved me three times from taking my life. And, and I had no idea. I, I'm not saying that to pat myself on the back because I had no idea her life was so serious. I just wanted to, I just wanted to meet with her and encourage her and not realising, in a sense, how badly damaged she was by the old place. And if, if we think about spiritual abuse in the church, um, I, um, Scott McKnight sort of uh, puts together a bit of a definition, uh, also relating to a, a book by um, uh, The Maze of Spiritual Abuse, Creating Healthy Christian Cultures. 
um, by uh, Oakley and Humphrey. And, and he says, spiritual abuse is a form of emotional and psychological abuse. It's, it's characterised by a systematic pattern of coercive and controlling behaviour in a religious context. And spiritual abuse can have a deeply damaging impact on those who experience it. Manipulation, exploitation, enforced accountability, requirements for secrecy and, and silence, and, and so on. And, and we've got to learn, I guess to really listen to each other. And, uh, and, if, uh, and we, as, as elders of the church, have got to learn to listen. And, and you as a, a congregation, a, a, as a fellowship, you've got to learn to listen to each other, that we can encourage and support each other. Because we're, we're going through, many, uh, many of us are going through deep waters. Um, Acts 20 is, uh, to me, has been a helpful passage, particularly the phrase where um, uh, Paul comes to meet the elders uh, at Miletus and he, he sort of gives them, in a sense, his final message on church life and he says, uh, and he says to the elders, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. For I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you. Savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and men will rise up even from your own number and distort the truth to lure the disciples into following them. And as we think about the future of this fellowship, we've got to recognise that God says there's going to be some savage wolves come in and not only come in but also arise from within. It's not that the end of this church, I, I think in a, in a sense it's unlikely that someone will come in that door and, uh, and, uh, and say, don't worry, Jesus is not God or, or the Bible is not the word of God. So often the devil uses internal people, uses internal disagreements, uses internal pride to take over a fellowship. And so we've got to be on the alert. And that's why he says, I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. He goes on to talk about his own character. I haven't coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You know that I've worked hard with my own hands to support myself. Um, and, and, and he says, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And if we're going to stay on the track, God is saying to us, we've all got to learn to grow together and grow in his word, and, and start to recognise where boundaries are being crossed, where we're just drifting off. I sort of look back over these last five years, and when we left, uh, about 100 people left the church. And uh, I sort of, um, in some ways... That was a tragedy, uh, that something that had begun well lost its way. But then uh, it was actually encouraging to me that it wasn't just my personal uh, thing, that this was something that a number of people had come to see. And, and I think what we've got to recognise is how does this happen um, no church is absolutely good or bad. I mean, one of the things I love about City Light is that City Light says, well, we're a part of what God is doing in Adelaide. We're not the, the be-all and the end-all. This isn't the only place where God is working. We're simply a part of what God is doing in the city. 
And uh, years ago, I, I met a man called uh, Bob Boardman. And uh, he was a US Marine back in World War II. And uh, they used to come out to Australia before they would go to the Pacific Front uh, fighting the, the Japanese. And, um, and he got involved in a drunken brawl at, in uh, Ballarat, probably fighting Australian soldiers. And uh, anyway, had to spend a couple of weeks in hospital. And there happened to be a Gideon's Bible in his little bedside cabinet. And he started to read the New Testament. And he came to know Jesus. He came to give his life to Jesus. And then he went off to Okinawa and, uh, uh, and was fighting and got shot in the neck. And uh, he had to learn to speak all over again. And for the rest of his life, uh, he could only speak in this sort of hoarse whisper. And um, he felt pretty nasty things about Japan. And God changed his heart and gave him such a love for the Japanese people that he went there as a missionary for the rest of his life. And uh, he came and shared once uh, with us about persevering in what is right. And he says, here we are on the, on, on the straight and narrow church life the way it should be, an individual's life the way God wants it. And at some point, there comes this imperceptible point of departure. And, and, and things start to go off, and perhaps even the person doesn't see it. Perhaps even the church doesn't see it. But then questions start to be asked about what's happening. And a legalistic church, an abusive church, will clamp down on those questions and not allow them. But an open, healthy church will accept those questions and say, Are we, have we taken that imperceptible point of departure? Have we gone off? And then finally, it becomes public. But it didn't become public overnight in the same way that a church doesn't become abusive overnight. An individual doesn't, in a sense, uh, become abusive overnight. They've been allowed to develop that way. And, and we here just so much want to be open to questions. You know, why do we do certain things? Why does so-and-so do this or that? It's, it's not about this control, but it's about wanting to do what is right. Um, another missionary I met, Jim Peterson, was a missionary in Brazil. And uh, he said uh, uh, one time a, a young pastor came to him and, uh, and said, uh, Jim, uh, you know, I really want to succeed in my ministry. I really want to be a successful pastor. I, I think there was an element of pride in there. But anyway, Jim very graciously said to him, you're never going to be able to really help people until, unless they can see that you are just as broken as them, that you haven't arrived. If you want to try and put on this impression that you've arrived, then people won't come to you for help because they'll think it's impossible to achieve it. Whereas if we're going to help each other, we long for that openness and vulnerability. I, I think in a way that whole word vulnerability was something we learnt when we came here. Because in the old church we almost had to pretend that we'd arrived. Now theologically we would never have said that. But in operations, operationally, you couldn't, ignore, you couldn't admit any struggles, any deep struggles. I, I know before we left, one young man came to, a, uh, came to me and, and he said, if you promise never to tell anyone else, uh, I just want to share with you my life and the struggles I'm going through. And uh, I have not told anyone else since. And, but that was the kind of crazy environment that a church should not be. We, we should have an openness. And yes, there will be 
confidential things that you might come to an elder or someone in the church and those confidences have to be maintained. But there has to be an openness, a vulnerability, a, a true walking in the light where we're honest and, and open with each other. And the problem with abusive churches is that they can want to cover that up and, and, uh, and squash it. Back in um, 2014, uh, my mother died. Um, at, she, was, uh, she got to 92 when she was still pretty bright. She was a beautiful woman and loved Jesus. And uh, I grew up in Tasmania, so I, I had to go to Tasmania for the funeral. And uh, the church uh, said to me, um, uh, are you going to go to your mother's funeral? And... Uh, I said, well, of course I'm going to go to my mother's funeral, you know. It, it's, but that was how, in a sense, somehow, the church had got um, hold of this crazy idea that you can't swan around going to your mother's funeral. And, and, and you say, but that's not rational. That's not biblical. But that's how churches can become because people want to control your life. And, uh, and you, you stand back and people say, yeah, but I can't understand the reasoning for that. And I say, well, that's your first mistake. You're expecting a, a real reason, a rational reason, a biblical reason, and there isn't any. And, and, and God, and so in a sense, I knew that that was, that was it. If I went to my mother's funeral, which I did, um, uh, that was going to be the end. And, and what a crazy way to think that a church becomes so controlling that... Uh, and, and I say again this... I know the whole message has been a bit heavy, but I say this just to help you to see how controlling a church can become. And it's not what Jesus ever intended about the church. I said to the family, to all our five children, uh, um, I'm going and I can understand you're all working... You may not be able to get time off. Well, they all loved my mother and they all came. And yet, you know, a year later, they were being told, your parents don't know how to find the will of God. They went to the mother's funeral. And it was just, uh, that, was, that was the end, which was a very sad end to, uh, to our uh, church relationship. And, and, and I can understand that there are, some of you may have come out of very, controlling places whether it's narcissistic family life whether it's narcissistic church life I think one of the things I want to say to encourage you is that God brings different people into your life to help you step by step and uh, one man who was so helpful to us uh, when we left he said uh, he said Harold I, I can't imagine you going to a church that will have wrong doctrine but what you really need is a church that has a beautiful community of relationships so that you might learn that for your life and for your family. And, uh, and that's what you all have done for Ruth and myself and our family. And we're very thankful, very thankful for that. God gave us a, a beautiful promise in Psalm 109, where to verse 26, Help me, Lord my God. Save me according to your faithful love, so that they may know that this is your hand and that you, Lord, have done it. Though they curse, you will bless. And God showed us the, and woke us up to what was going on and, and we had to leave. If you want to read more about, I guess, some other passages, which we really haven't got time. I, I could probably talk with you for about five hours on this whole topic. Uh, but I, I think, think about next time as you read the Gospels, you know, the Gospel of Matthew, look at Jesus and how he started to deal with spiritual abuse from the scribes and the Pharisees. There he was, a, a man with a withered hand, and the scribes and the Pharisees said, uh, you, you know, you can't heal him, it's the Sabbath. 
how much it must have grieved Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath, who gave us the Sabbath principle of rest and, and you couldn't heal someone, make them better on that day. He said, you've totally missed the point of the whole thing. A number of times he had to say, you've turned my commandments into wrong traditions. He was pretty straight with the Pharisees. Um, you know, he, uh, he said instead of, in Matthew 23, instead of giving you God's law as food and drink by which you can banquet on God, you know, you package it up into bundles of rules, loading people down like pack animals. They seem, you seem to take pleasure in watching people stagger under these loads and wouldn't think of lifting a finger to help. So often a legalistic church loses sight of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, his, his undeserved favour. And, uh, and another book, I think, that can really help, I know it helped us incredibly, and it was just uh, the sovereignty of God that we uh, went to a conference where the theme was the, the book of Galatians and being set free from the law. And uh, I remember sitting down and reading um, chapter 6, the, uh, where Paul talks about the cross. And he says, because of that cross, I've been crucified in relation to the world. I've been set free from the stifling atmosphere of pleasing others and fitting into the little patterns that they dictate. Can't you see the central issue in all this? It's not what you and I do whether we submit, in this case, submit to circumcision or not, reject circumcision, it's what God is doing. And he's creating something totally new, a free life. You know, that was like a hot summer's day. It was like diving into the swimming pool to just see how much I'd been caught up in thinking that Christianity was all about just doing what people say it, it's like that um, the misuse of that uh, phrase uh, touch not the Lord's anointed and uh, while I think if God has done a work through a certain person there has to be a respect it, it doesn't mean that the Lord's anointed is beyond having boundaries and uh, and so touch not the Lord's anointed it's a misuse to say that a pastor or a leader in the church or anyone in the church can do as they feel like. It, so often that's part of the trap of this whole spiritual abuse is we misuse uh, scripture. We make it sound spiritual and, and, and then we, uh, and we can twist it around to then uh, control, control people. So... I think just to, just to finish, I wanted to share with you a passage that again has been such an encouragement and a blessing to me from Isaiah 43. And, uh, and God says, don't fear, I've redeemed you. I've called you by name, you are mine. And when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And leaving the old church, um, it, it, it was a whole emotional upheaval. In a sense, it was like walking out on my life and all that I'd known. And, uh, and, and so I, I became quite sick, physically sick with it. And, and, uh, but God came to me in a new way and his promises. And uh, he says in Isaiah 43, because you are precious in my sight and honoured and I love you. I will give people in exchange for you and nations for your life. It's yes, the immediate application is to Israel, but we are by faith, we inherit the promises of the seed in Abraham. And, uh, and, and I believe that this God says to each one of us today, you're precious, you're very precious in my sight and I love you and I've got this amazing plan 
for your life. And, uh, and he, so he goes on in the chapter to say, look, I'm about to do something new. Don't you see it? Don't remember past events. Don't pay attention to things of old. It may be that those who have been narcissistic and controlling in the past will never recognise that. There may never be a reconciliation. And, but God says, I want you to move on and to go on into a new life, into this new thing that God is doing. That's what keeps us when we, we're not trying, like here at City Light, we're not trying to create a work. We're wanting to enter in. Uh, you know, Jesus said, my father is working and I am working. And we want to enter in to his working. And that's what's going to keep us from spiritual abuse developing within our body, within our fellowship. So we all need to be alert. And as I've, as I've said to you a number of times, I'm sorry for a very heavy topic, but it is so relevant to the future of, of our fellowship. And uh, I know someone said this morning after the fellowship, after the time, um, it closed, it, it provided some closure for them to see that they don't have to try and restore everything from the past when people don't recognise what they've done. But we move on. We're always open to reconciliation if it comes, if the other people do recognise that. But we've got to learn by the grace of God to forgive and to press on and, uh, and, and enter in to what Jesus is doing here. I, I look back and see how uh, Jesus worked in my heart, in our family's life. It was just amazing that our whole family woke up I'd hate to think what it would be like if half of them were still back in the old place. But God uh, woke us all up to what was going on. And, uh, and I trust that each of you will enter in to what God is doing. My father is working and I am working. And, and so I long to work in, in his working. So let me we finish with that passage again from Matthew 11. Are you tired, worn out, burnt out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and, and work with me and, and watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. And that's my prayer for you all, that you'll all learn to live in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to come around the table of our Lord now in time of uh, communion, of remembrance of our Lord. And at this time we come, we partake of, uh, of the bread and of the cup. We, we remember that Jesus himself took the load. He took the load of our sin. He took the curse of, of our sin. And as the scriptures say, he bore it in his own body on the cross. And the blood of Jesus Christ washes away our sin. And perhaps you're uh, still on the journey of faith. Um, when we come, but to become a Christian, to become a believer, is, is to turn from the life that you've been living without God going your own way and to turn and to put your faith, your dependence upon Jesus and what he's done for you. It, it's not about what I have done or haven't done. It's about what God has done. And God has given his own son, Jesus, to die on the cross for our sin. It's something that for the rest of your life, it's like a deep swimming pool and yet you'll never get to the bottom as you start to look at the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and all that he's done for us. So join with us now around the, uh, around the table as we 
remember our Lord Jesus Christ and his great love for us.